It is time for Sports Memo's betting podcast, college football, every game on the board. We got our first guest up, Robbie Vino. Rob, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I am great today, Drew. How about yourself? Doing good. Excited to get after this this card. We got uh, three Friday night games and then a full slate of Saturday college football. And guys out there, this is SportsMemo.com. College football, every game on the board. We're going to be talking every single college football game each and every week at SportsMemo.com. We got North Carolina at Wake Forest up first, Robbie. And looks like the Demon Deacons laying three at home. 66 the total here, Robbie. Yeah, a good game, Drew. Um, I think first things first, we'll keep an eye on the weather in Winston, in Winston-Salem for Friday night. There's about a 40% chance of thunderstorms late afternoon, early evening, and this is a 6 o'clock Eastern time kickoff. So we'll keep an eye on it. I, I'm not too worried about it right this second, but um, next 48 hours will tell us a little bit more. As for the game itself, uh, you know, I find it to be a pretty difficult situational spot for North Carolina, Drew. They've been through a really rugged first two games. And in rapid fire fashion, I mean, they've played August 31st, September 7th. So you're talking about eight days there plus five more. This will be their 13, or third game in 13 days. Friday night contest. They played late night. Uh, Saturday night against Miami so shorter work schedule than it will be for Wake Forest which played Friday night to get the extra day of prep here but I do think that going through South Carolina where they were underdog and then having to go through that tough Miami game conference game where they were underdog both games were come from behind victories in the fourth quarter feel like it takes a little bit out of North Carolina here Wake Forest meanwhile had a tough one with Utah State first game of the year I think that prepped them for the season they come back they steamroll rice Um, I find them to be in better situational shape in this game and of course at home a couple of injuries to worry about here for North Carolina one starting corner down for this game starting center down for this game Um, so a couple of keys there for North Carolina now of course the coaching staff talks up both positions and their backups both guys have played Uh, So they're stepping in, not necessarily new to the positions. uh, But still, I see Wake Forest having a little bit of an advantage here. Total's fairly high. Don't know if I want to get up there and play this um, over. A little scared to play it under because both offenses have great potential. And obviously, the Wake Forest defense doesn't stop many people. But you have to be impressed with what UNC has done on the defensive end so far this season. So uh, for me... Probably at this point in time, I'm leaning a little bit toward Wake Forest. We'll see what happens when the kickoff comes Friday. We got 105, 106 up next. Kansas, Boston College, BC land 21 at home, 51 the total, Robbie. Disappointing uh, game for Kansas last week, Drew. At home against Coastal Carolina and with the return of Puka Williams at running back. And they went nowhere. They get beat outright on their home field by Coastal. Uh, typical typical I mean detractors would say typical less miles offensive performance right uh, they get 280 yards total offense defense played very very well only 291 given up before Kansas like I say when you add Puka Williams back he's off of the suspension for the first game uh, a lot of articles during the week thought that Kansas's offense would be ready to go here it was not and now you have to go to Chestnut Hill and play Boston College. That's not an easy feat. First two games of the season, KU has played Indiana State, a good FCS team. They played Coastal Carolina, a mid-rung to lower-rung Sunbelt team. And they haven't done a thing offensively. And now they have to go try and play Boston College, who should be lying in wait for them. They had an off week last or not an off week, but they had Richmond last week, an FCS team. Uh, it's kind of a breather in between the Virginia Tech game where they won their first conference game of the year and this one. I like BC here. Um, I just don't know that Kansas has enough of a balanced offense to keep up with BC, which does have a balanced offense this year between uh, the ground game, which is absolutely um, fantastic with A.J. Dillon and then Anthony Brown at quarterback has shown to be much better through the air this season. 
Um, I think BC could probably name the score here. Tough trip for Kansas in this game, I think. And Robbie, to complete the trifecta on Friday night, we got the late night action here. Washington State at Houston. Battle of the Cougars. Pac-12 Cougars versus AAC Cougars with uh, the Washington State Cougars laying nine, seeing eight, seeing nine and a half. So depending where you're shopping, there's some opinion in this market. We're seeing 74 as the total. Thinking a lot of offense here, Robbie. What are you thinking here, Washington versus Houston? Well, first thing I need to know is are you going to label it the degenerate special for Friday night? I guess it, it is, but it's not the um, 1030s where okay. I really like to do the degenerate special. In the, you know, the Hawaii home games, those are the best. This is only 915 Eastern, so I guess for Friday, considering it's Friday night lights, but it, I don't think it deserves the degenerate special just yet. All right, we won't throw that tag on it, but we will say that you know both of these teams have had coaches that are really good friends. Both come from the same coaching tree. Dana Holgerson, Mike Leach, both know each other's offenses inside and out because they run the same thing. Uh, Question becomes who has the better personnel on the field. Right now, if you go overall talent, it's Washington State because they play superior defense to what the Houston Cougars play last week against Prairie View. Houston may have gotten caught in a little bit of a sandwich, right? They played Oklahoma first game. They're staring down the barrel of Washington State at home third game. So the Prairie View, um, a little bit excusable. Prairie View is not a a miserable FCS team by any stretch of the imagination. They're a fairly decent SWAC team. So we'll we'll sort of give Houston a pass on that game. But they're going to have to really um, do a lot offensively here to keep up with Washington State, which, boy, oh, boy, has been uh, really good on the offensive end so far. Now, they have not been tested. Uh, Very easy to look at the numbers and be impressed. But again, the opposition is New Mexico State. We saw what Alabama did to them. Uh, Obviously, if you're New Mexico State running around and going to Washington State and then going to Alabama, not the easiest of schedules to have to play. But Washington State rolls averaging 606 yards per game um, for the Washington State Cougars drew you know there was a big question to start the season as to who the quarterback should be on this team and Mike Leach took that decision all the way to the wire most people thought that Gabe Gubrid or Gabe Gubrid excuse me would win that battle the kid from Eastern Washington but as it ended up Anthony Gordon was the choice and he's been Real, real good so far. In fact, he's bordered on spectacular. Again, not great competition, but when you're completing 81% of your passes and you've thrown 74 of them, there's nothing cheap about that. Um, I think that both of these teams are going to get up and down the field. I think Houston poses threats offensively that Washington State hasn't seen and probably won't handle. And I also believe that, you know, Houston just doesn't have enough defense to slow Washington State down. The only advantage Houston has, Drew, in my mind, is the fact that they've already played Oklahoma. And if you've seen Oklahoma's speed, maybe that's a little bit of a help or a benefit when it comes to playing Washington State. But I just don't know that in either case, Houston's going to slow anybody down. So probably an overlook for me in that game. All right, Robbie. Good stuff on the Friday night slate. We got Saturday's action here. We're going to hit a few of them with Robbie before we turn it over to the next guest. At the top of the card here in the Big Ten, we got Ohio State, the Buckeyes, visiting the Hoosiers at Indiana here. 61 the total with Ohio State laying 16 and a half on the road, Robbie. Yeah, I wonder about a bit of a letdown factor here, too, for Ohio State, Drew. A lot was made of last week's game against Cincinnati. And boy, the betting market loaded up on Cincinnati. Uh, The number went down, 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 all the way to kickoff time. Um, Obviously, Luke Fickle has a top-tier AAC team, brings them in with high expectations, and Ohio State simply destroys them. They were fully focused for that game, ready to go from the outset, 31-13 to edge in first downs, 508-273 to total yardage advantage. They did not let Cincinnati run the football whatsoever, only 107 yards rushing in that game on 34 carries. Desmond Ritter, the quarterback for Cincinnati, got nothing going in that contest. So for Ohio State, that was a fully focused, um, I guess very satisfying 42 to nothing win. 
this is a conference game and it's a divisional game. I get it. So you're going to get focus again. But I just wonder if Ohio State brings the same exact level of interest to this contest against Indiana. And if they don't, Indiana's got plenty of weaponry on the offensive side of the football, Drew, both in the running game and in the passing game. In fact, their quarterback battle, which ended up being won by Michael Penix, has turned out to be a great decision as well, uh, the dual threat quarterback. Obviously, Ohio State sees Ritter last week, a dual threat QB, so they're going to get another one this week. But Penix has much more to work with as far as the aerial attack is concerned. Um, Indiana, you know, Westbrook's been on that team. Nick Westbrook has been a receiver for that team for the last three years. And right now he's only the fourth leading receiver on the team, just to show you how deep they are at the wide receiver position. So Ohio State's going to have to play both ends of the field here, or both all three levels of the field here. Can't just load up against the run like you can do against Cincinnati. So I think Indiana can cause some trouble. They're going to be so fired up for this game. The Hoosiers will at home. I think the points might be worth taking here with Indiana. And we're talking with Robbie Vino from SportsMemo.com. His five percenters last year in college football went 11-3. and three. That's 79%. So he uh, hits the big plays with a lot of authority here. And, guys, we got the uh, coupon code VINO49. That's V-E-N-O-4-9 at checkout. SportsMemo.com. You can get his seven-day all-access. Normally 119 bucks, Discounted on the site to 99 bucks. And with this podcast coupon code of vino49 it will take 50 bucks off make it only 49 bucks seven day all access pass get every sport every play that rob vino releases for only 49 dollars using the coupon code vino49 at checkout we got kansas state at mississippi state up next here robbie with uh, the bulldogs in starkville laying eight 51 and a half the total seeing a little uh, injury here with Tommy Stevens their their quarterback shoulder injury the redshirt freshman came in actually played pretty well I think they had a quarterback battle in in the offseason anyway so not how mu- not sure how much that's going to affect it but Kansas State they've had a rough time playing against SEC schools in recent past years and uh, they're 2 and 0 out the gate Robbie straight up and against the spread but this is a different animal heading down to the SEC and taking on Mississippi State in Starkville Uh, I lean with Mississippi State here how do you feel well Tommy Stevens it looks like he's gonna go now Drew reports today um, list him as probable and the day-to-day tag has kind of been taken off of him I guess the question would be is you know how badly is the shoulder hurt can he make downfield throws but I don't think they would start him if he couldn't, uh, Joe Moorhead would obviously take uh, care of him. Uh, had the connection to him, of course, from Penn State, where Stevens was the backup quarterback <clears throat> the last couple of years while Moorhead was there. Um, the Kansas State team is a little bit of a surprise so far this year, right? Um, they've come out of the gate firing Chris Kleiman, first year there from North Dakota State. Um, obviously, a pro style offense. And they've made a lot of use of two transfer running backs. James Gilbert, we remember him from Ball State as their lead rusher. Jordan Brown, transfer from North Carolina. Both of these guys leading the ground attack here for KSU. Again, much like earlier when we talked about um, Power 5 teams against overmatched opponents. That's what it's been for K-State. Nickel State and Bowling Green, certainly like you said, Mississippi State's a different animal. You have to be impressed with the 694 yards on the ground they've put up so far. But Mississippi State's going to stack the box, right? They're not going to be afraid of Skylar Thompson and that throwing game of Kansas State. So it's going to be up to them to be physical enough to root the eight-man front of Mississippi State, uproot them, and push them back. And I don't know that they can. Uh, If it doesn't happen, MSU probably can uh, hold Kansas State to – 20 or less in that case the line looks a little bit small mississippi state offensively they've got a talented runner of their own in kylan hill and if stevens is okay to go which i have to assume he is now that moorhead has listed him as probable uh they can probably attack k-state downfield in a way that k-state has not been attacked so far in their first two games so i have to agree with you uh sec country different type of team here major step up in class 
Uh, Mississippi State's had a couple of games now to get things under their belt. And let's not forget that Mississippi State has played two really physical teams that are local to them that really wanted to go in and get a victory. I, I, UL Lafayette under Billy Napier has that Alabama um, mental attitude. And that's what Napier wanted to bring to this team. They're physical on both sides of the line. They run the football down your throat. They performed very well against MSU. Southern Miss comes in, another good team from Conference USA, very physical, very tough. And Kansas State's the third one in a row that Mississippi State will face. It's nothing new for them. I think they'll be able to handle it here. Um, I like what Kansas State has done so far, but just don't see them being able to, you know, come within eight points of Mississippi State in this game. Robbie, good stuff so far. We got NC State at West Virginia here, ACC versus Big 12 action with uh, the Wolfpack laying a full touchdown at most shops. Some shops still at six and a half, important one to shop around. We got 45 and a half the total. Interesting to see a West Virginia game uh, totaled in the 40s here, Robbie, but that's what it is now going forward. And it looks like uh, touchdown favorites here with NC State on the road. You interested in betting it? You know what? So far, West Virginia has proven to be what most thought they would be coming in, and that is down this year. But you know what? They beat James Madison. You and I talked about it last week. JMU uh, looked at by many as the top FCS team in the country this year. North Dakota State, of course, always something to say about that, the reigning champions. But James Madison, excuse me, is on that level. West Virginia gets them 2013, but then they go to Missouri and get blown out last week, 38-7. Mizzou, happy to be out of the altitude, comes home, uh, outgains them 382 to 171. I'll say this about Neil Brown's team so far. They've played pretty good defense. James Madison is an offensive powerhouse, and Missouri's an offensive powerhouse. And right now, West Virginia is only allowing 355 total yardage per game. So very, very good on the defensive end, but it's the offensive end where they've struggled. And they might struggle here against NC State, which just seems to keep reloading on the defensive side. Now, they've had two opponents that they should have handled, and they did beat East Carolina. Although I'll say this, East Carolina coming in with Houston Aylers at quarterback had a lot of hype behind them this year. Uh, As far as improvement is concerned, didn't happen. NC State beats them 34-6, come back and shut out Western Carolina 41-0. There's a couple of freshman running backs people should get to know on this North Carolina State team. Zonovan Knight and Jordan Houston, one guy averaging over eight yards per carry, the other guy averaging near seven per carry. They've run the football extremely well against the first two opponents in Morgantown. Uh, The way West Virginia has handled their first two offensive opponents, I don't know if that stuff flies here, Drew. And you've got a uh, first-time quarterback here in NC State. How's he going to react on the road? So I feel like the betting markets have soured on West Virginia, and therefore we're probably getting a little bit of value right now with a team that's very good on the defensive end. NC State hasn't been prepped for an opponent like this yet. I, I'm more. Than, I'm almost willing to take a shot with West Virginia in this instance at home. If they can't come close here, they probably don't come close. You know, next week they have Kansas, but after that, it's the thick of the Big 12 schedule. And I don't know if they come close anywhere in the rest of the Big 12 season if they can't come close here against NC State. So I might look towards West Virginia plus points. We got Maryland at Temple up next. High total here, Robbie, 66 and a half. Maryland, the Terps, minus seven, minus seven and a half on the road. Uh, man, Maryland's come out swinging this season, Robbie. I didn't see it happening. I, I was down on Jackson, but he's a lot better this season. Um, interesting handicap going forward are the Terps and now having to lay a touchdown against a tough Temple team. Uh, how are you looking about this one, man? Well, it's hard at this point in time after what we've seen from Maryland to go against Maryland. And that offense is just a well-oiled machine. And even if we throw out the week one victory, which was obviously against a miserable uh, FCS opponent in Howard, you win 79 to nothing okay, but the 623 to 68 total yardage gap is insane. But then they just come back from the opening kickoff last week and destroy Syracuse, a team that had shut out Liberty the week before, and a team that Dino, where Dino Babers, their head coach, had called the defense the new anchor of their team. If that's the anchor of their team, 
and they give up 63 points and 650 yards to Maryland. They're not going very far. Maryland scored those 63 points so fast. Um, it, it was unbelievable how quickly they scored in that game. They're well-balanced this year, both through the year. As you mentioned, Josh Jackson, I'm with you. I didn't see it out of him in, at Virginia Tech, but we certainly saw it out of him last week. Maryland has skill, position, talent, and speed all over the field. Um, they've got a running back stable that's totally insane. And right now, as good as Temple is, and even the fact that Temple had a week to prepare for this, right? They had the bye week last week, so they come off of um, trouncing of Bucknell week off, get ready for Maryland. I don't know that Temple's ready to handle this. I really don't. We have to remember that this is a first-time coaching staff here at Temple. Rod Carey had some good defenses at Northern Illinois, both as um, as an assistant coach and uh, actually he was an offensive line coach, but the defenses at Northern Illinois, where he came from, were very, very good. His When he was a head coach, they were good for five years. So he knows how to coach defense, and he's probably got you know a little bit better talent here at Temple than he had at Northern Illinois. But I just don't know that this team is ready with one game under their belt and two new systems, and that one game was against Bucknell. If Maryland gets out top 14 nothing here this week, like they did against Syracuse last week, then it's really, really difficult for me to see Temple catching up in this game. They cannot match Maryland point for point. They're going to have to slow the game, run the football. Um, Maryland's defense right now is swarming, Drew. I just don't see any way, any reason to bet against Maryland at this point in time. Now, 66 and a half is a lot of points. Uh, so maybe you can look at under now because it's been carried from 62 all the way to 66 and a half. Maybe uh, it's kind of gone past its limit. But I do think Maryland minus the points has to be the way to go or else just pass the game one or the other. Robbie, let's head to the state of Ohio. We got Miami of Ohio versus Cincinnati. The Bearcats lay in 17, total of 49. I think they're going to bounce back here, Drew. Uh, You know, they put a lot of eggs in that basket last week, and they got slaughtered 42 to nothing. It really wasn't close. I think Ohio State let them know where their place in college football is, and it's not among the elite teams in the nation. Uh, But at the first week of the season, they played UCLA and beat them 24 to 14. And it's still a good football team. They're just not on Ohio State's level. They're a better football team than Miami of Ohio is this year. Now, Miami of Ohio, um, the last couple of years has been pretty good. They got whacked by Iowa by 24, then come back and get an easy one against Tennessee Tech. It would be easy to say that Cincinnati's off of two tough games, probably a little disheartened by what happened at Ohio State. But I think Fickle and that coaching staff will pick them right back up and have them ready to go here. Um, and this point spread's a little steep, no doubt about it. You're up to 17 and a half right now, which is above that key number of 17, and that's tough. So I wouldn't be, it's not something that I'd rush to the window with, but it's something that I think could cash here, Cincinnati minus the points. Just don't see Cincinnati um, allowing Miami of Ohio to get beyond the 17-point mark in this one. The total's interesting, Drew, at 49 because I think Cincinnati's got the potential to run the football here after watching Miami of Ohio give up 213 yards, 5.2 per carry against Iowa. Cincinnati, um, you know, Iowa's got Nate Stanley, who's a drop-back passer, but Cincinnati with Desmond Ritter, the uh, dual-threat quarterback, I think poses a problem to Miami. So I might look over 49 here. I just, for some reason, I find that number to be a little bit low. All right, Robbie. And guys, remember the coupon code VINO49 at checkout for Rob Vino's seven-day all-access package. You'll get every play he releases for the next week in every sport for only 49 bucks using the coupon code VENO49. VINO49 at checkout, sportsmemo.com. We got last game up, Robbie. Then we're going to turn it over to mid-major Matt for the next section. We got Pittsburgh at Penn State. Looks like the Nittany Lions, minus 17, 53 the total, Robbie. You know, I wish we had last year's Pittsburgh team, which could run the football uh, extremely well, but they're not the same offensive team this year. Their, Their strength right now lies in Kenny Pickett in that passing game, and that's understandable. I think when we went through 
the ACC preview a couple months back, I had mentioned that Mark Whipple is one of my favorite offensive coordinators. He's a great play caller, but he's an aggressive head coach throwing the foot, or an aggressive coach. He was an aggressive head coach as well at UMass. But as an offensive coordinator, he's aggressive getting the ball down the field. Kenny Pickett last week against Ohio U throws for over 300 yards. And Pitt wins that game 20-10. to 10. Total yardage gap against Ohio U, a good Frank Solich team, was 481-212. to But they didn't really do much on the ground. And they didn't do much on the ground, if anything at all, the week before against Virginia. If you watch the uh, Penn State-Buffalo game last week, Buffalo did a little bit of damage on the ground. And Ed did a little through the air, too. They were pretty well balanced. They gained 429 total yards in that game actually outgained Penn State how many teams lose by 32 and outgain the opponent by 70 yards not very um, often so, not very often right so if Penn State had their hands full and I think it was because they couldn't really stop the run of Buffalo and Buffalo kept pounding it at them if I knew Pittsburgh could do that and wouldn't abandon it I'd probably be uh, a little more in Pittsburgh's corner but Penn State's asset with that front seven of theirs, which is tremendous, um, is the pass rush. And I can see Kenny Pickett and that weak offensive line having a lot of trouble every time they drop back here in this game. Penn State's offense has not really um, turned it on yet. Obviously, Sean Clifford, new quarterback here, but he looked pretty good last week. He had a long touchdown run. Second half, Penn State really looked a lot better than they did first half. I could see them once again overwhelming Pitt the way they did last year and I think it's basically because Pittsburgh just doesn't run the football well enough if they could I'd be on that side don't know that I'll be on anybody's side here Um, but Pittsburgh is going to be much more of a throwing team this season and I think that type of offense plays into Penn State's hands he's Rob Vino 11 and 3 last year 78 percent in college football, 5% plays. Check it out at sportsmemo.com. And you can get his whole week of service, every sport, every play, for just 49 bucks. Coupon code VINO49. We'll be right back. Short break with uh, Mid-Major Matt breaking down the next section of games on the college football card. <laughs> 